as in the case of the takeoff, you already know most of the fundamentals of landing the airplane. The wing level power off stall, which was previously demonstrated, is an integral part of the power off landing. In executing this stall, you will remember that we first cut the throttle and assume a glide. Then we ease the nose up slowly so that the stick is all the way back and the plane in the three-point attitude at the instant the stall occurs. And that's exactly what you do when you land the plane. Except you so plan the glide and the stall that the plane is within inches of the ground at the instant the stall occurs. And all three wheels hit the ground at approximately the same instant. You want the plane to be traveling as slowly as possible when it hits the ground from the standpoint of safety and because the slower it is traveling when it lands, the shorter its landing run will be. Also, you want the plane to hit the ground on all three points. Why? Well, for the same reason you don't put two legs on a three-legged stool. Three points give you more stability and safety. Also, you want to get used to how the plane looks on the ground, the position of the nose in relation to the horizon, because that is the landing attitude. When you're breaking your glide and the plane reaches that attitude, it is stalling and therefore should also be landing. We use the gliding approach to a power-off landing, but we don't want to land at gliding speed. It's much too fast for that, so we slow the plane up. How? By easing the nose up out of the gliding attitude. But slowing up the plane means that the air flows less rapidly over the wings, and that in turn cuts down lift. So as we bring the nose up, the plane continues to follow a downward path, even though the nose is steadily rising. The direction the nose is pointed is getting further and further from the direction the plane is traveling, until finally the air can no longer flow smoothly over the wings to form the low pressure area. So the plane stalls and lands at the same time. Thus it lands at the slowest possible speed. And it is so designed that, properly handled, the stall occurs at the same time the plane is in the three-point attitude. A bird lands that same way. It uses the gliding approach, then brings its nose up smoothly to slow down its glide. Finally, it settles to a landing at the same instant its wings stall, and thus it lands at the slowest possible speed. Also, a bird lands and takes off into the wind. And so, whatever possible, does an airplane. Supposing we're using this field for our landing practice, we must first determine the direction of the wind. Some fields have a wind T to indicate the direction the wind is coming from. Some have a tetrahedron. This field, it so happens, has a wind sock. So, having determined the direction the wind is coming from, we try to visualize the direction of the wind in relation to the field. Obviously, we can't land directly into the wind unless we have the wind direction well in mind. The power-off approach to a landing begins with the plane headed at right angles to the landing line at an altitude of 500 feet. At about this point, we cut the throttle, assume a glide, and start a turn in toward the field. Also, we trim the plane to help us hold the correct gliding attitude and speed. As we approach the new heading, we start to roll out of the turn so that when the wings are level, we are headed directly into the wind. With our heading established, we must now keep the plane absolutely straight. To do this, we look well ahead, watching the nose in relation to the scenery to see that it doesn't swerve to one side or the other. We want to keep it exactly on heading. And just as important, the wings must be level and must remain level. Try to see the whole picture, your wings and your nose, in relation to all the scenery within your range of vision and in relation to the horizon. Don't concentrate on any one thing. Divide your attention and see everything at once. Now somewhere along here, we begin to ease the nose up, breaking the glide and slowing down the speed of the plane. As the nose eases up gradually, you can hear the plane getting slower. There's less pressure on the controls. It continues to slow down and settle so that it stalls in the three-point attitude with a stick all the way back just a few inches off the ground. 
One of the common mistakes made by beginning students is handling the plane too roughly. For example, the glide must be broken gradually and the nose eased up slowly. If you pull the nose up too fast, the result is a ballooning effect. Watch. Instead of continuing to settle, the plane actually pulls away from the ground. Not only does ballooning foul up your landing, but it also involves the risk of stalling a plane too high above the ground and bouncing you hard, or making it necessary for the instructor to take over to prevent an accident. But poorly controlled gliding speed can also cause you to balloon. We'll demonstrate. You can tell by the way this glide looks and sounds. We are in just about the right gliding attitude. The steady sound of the wind and the rigging remains at the same pitch, so you know your speed is constant. Now let's let the nose wander down too low for the correct gliding attitude. The hum of the wind goes into higher pitch. You can tell we're picking up speed. Listen. Now when we get ready to break our glide, even though we pull the nose up very slowly, the plane balloons. Instead of settling, it pulls up away from the ground. However, if you recognize the fact that you have too much speed, you can often land the airplane anyway, providing you have enough landing room. Instead of bringing the nose up into the three-point attitude, you merely ease it up into the level flight attitude, leveling off within a foot or two of the ground. Then you allow the plane to float until it loses its excess speed and you can land it. Once you level off and begin to lose speed, the plane will want to drop so the front wheels hit the ground. But you hold the plane off by gradually easing the nose up toward the three-point attitude. You continue slowly easing the nose up so the plane is in the three-point attitude with the stick all the way back at the moment the plane stalls and lands. But floating on a landing is merely a correction to get rid of excess speed, which you probably should never have acquired in the first place. The ideal landing is the landing you make out of a glide. There is no leveling off. The nose is pulled up steadily, smoothly, and continuously. There is no float, no ballooning. We mentioned a moment ago the importance of keeping the plane absolutely straight into the wind. Aside from the danger of collision with other planes, if the wind is of any strength, here's what may happen when you allow the plane to swerve off the wind line. Also, we emphasize the importance of keeping the wings level. Many students show a tendency to drop one wing or the other as they bring the nose up in breaking their glide. Like this. One wing down means you're either swerving or slipping. You land on one wheel, which again involves the risk of ground moving. Another very common mistake beginning students make in landings is landing the plane too high. This can happen in either one of two ways. The student starts to break his glide while he is still too high off the ground, so that when he reaches the three-point attitude and stalls, the ground is not there to catch him. The plane either has a considerable drop and lands very hard, or the instructor has to take over. Or a student will often land the plane high by breaking his glide too fast, that is, not fast enough to make the plane balloon, but fast enough so the plane slows down and is through flying before it has time to settle to the ground. The opposite of that, of course, is landing the plane too low, sometimes called flying it into the ground. So the front wheels hit the ground before the plane has reached the three-point attitude. This also can be caused by two different types of mistakes. Either by breaking the glide too late, so there isn't time to bring the nose up into the three-point attitude before the wheels hit the ground, or even though the student starts breaking his slide early enough, he may still make the mistake of flying the plane into the ground by bringing his nose up so slowly that the wheels hit the ground before the plane has reached the three-point attitude. Some students get the idea that there is a specific point or altitude at which they must always break their glide. But this is not the case. There is quite a space in the lower part of your gliding approach during which the glide may be broken. Within limits, it is not so much a case of where you break your glide as how fast you break it. For example, if you start to break your glide high, but bring your nose up slowly enough, continuously coordinating attitude with altitude, you can make a good landing despite the fact that you started to break your glide high. 
if, on the other hand, you start to break the glide low, but bring the nose up rapidly, although not so fast as to make the plane balloon, you can again make a good landing, despite the fact that you started to break the glide low. Landing the plane is strictly a matter of sight, sound, and pressures. You have to feel it in. You have to train your senses so that you know exactly how far you've progressed toward the stall, so that you'll know just when to land the plane. In order to know these things, you must be relaxed but alert. If you're all tensed up, you can't feel what the airplane wants to do. It's perfectly natural that you may tend to tense up on your first few landings. But the sooner you can counteract that tendency, the sooner you'll be able to land the airplane and take it off successfully. And whatever you do, avoid the mistake of our friend McDribble, who believes that the landing is completed once he has the plane on the ground. There are two things to remember about handling the plane after it is on the ground. Keep the tail firmly on the ground by keeping the stick all the way back. And keep the plane straight. When you've slowed down to approximately taxiing speed, put your feet up on the pedal so you'll be ready with the brakes in case you need it. But keep the plane rolling straight clear to the edge of the takeoff and landing area so you won't get in the way of other planes which may be landing or taking off near you. Raise your seat for taxiing, unlock your tail wheel, and before you turn, look back on the side toward which you're going to turn so you won't cut into anyone. shown you the elements that go to make up a landing. These elements are very much like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. You have to get them all together before you can make good landings. There will probably be times during your early training when you'll wonder if you'll ever learn to land the plane. Then suddenly one day you'll get all the pieces together as they should be and you'll make a good landing. And then another and another and you'll have it. But whatever you do to make landings and all flying easier for you right from the start, Try to make full use of your eyes, your ears, the pressures the controls give back to your hands and feet, and the pressures on the seat of your pants. 